Aitäh ja tänu sihtasutusele kutsumast siia Tallinnasse konverentsile. Tore taas olla Eestis ja natuke ka eesti keelt kõnelda siin, aga ma jätkan siis ingles keeles. Um, so, um, perhaps many of you were wondering why such defense and foreign policy guys is sitting here or standing here in front of you and talking about languages, but um, uh, perhaps my upbringing and also um, um, my um, work and in Parliament partially also on, on uh, uh, education is um, a reason for that. And also, um, thank you for inviting to such an honorable conference with such a, a distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, talking about language, um, the easiest answer actually, which would uh, sum up the whole of my presentation is that when you come from Baltic states, the same as from Benelux or from Switzerland, it's pretty obvious that you must know languages because you are between the bigger nations, a bigger trading blocks, and if you want to trade with other nations, you must know their languages. So it's kind of Q and A for that. But what I want to do today, um, I want to basically look on back, not so far away as my distinguished colleague looked back on the 19th century for Estonia, because if we speak about the Latvian language policy and the state building process, there are very many similarities with Estonia, with few exceptions, which I will touch upon some of them. And then if you are more interested, you're more than welcome to ask them in a Q&A session. So um, we speak about the Latvian minority languages, uh, which is actually the exact term, not the multinational language policy, which I put in a haste, and it's uh, not exactly the proper one. But then looking through the Soviet occupation period, where there were not so many innovations, even though my colleague from Estonia spoke about the foreign language education in uh, Mina Herma and other schools, there were similar examples in some of the Latvian schools, but it didn't provide much of the leeway. It was rather exception rather than rule. And then finally, look on the language reform as it started in 2002, and then how it goes on since 2014. So, uh, if we look on um, Latvian language policy, then both Latvian and Estonian language policy was very much um, in, in, indebted to the one guy uh, whose name is written here, uh, Baltic German, Paul Schiemann. And Paul Schiemann was a very active journalist, lawyer, um, politician. He was a member of parliament for quite many years, uh, representing the uh, Baltic German party. And he was also a member of the National Minorities Council in Europe. Uh, he um, got into loggerheads with the Nazi party after 1933. Because of that, he had to move to Austria, uh, where after Anschluss, he had to move back to Latvia, where he lived all the way till 1944, where he died during the Nazi occupation. He was the one who proposed the idea of the national minority schooling. And this policy was pretty much followed in Latvia and in Estonia throughout 1920s and 1930s, which provided possibility for national minorities to have instruction in their native languages. Well, rather, they be in Russians, Germans, Jews, uh, Finns, in Latvian case, Estonians, Lithuanians, Poles. So all these uh, national minority schools worked uh, pretty well. Uh, Paul Schiemann's ideas uh, were bearing uh, rather good fruits. Uh, but it all stopped on 1934 and 15th May, in particular in Latvia, after coup d'etat by Karl Solman's uh, regime. Uh, and what followed was pretty obvious and pretty uh, much a norm for the Europe at that time. That was the authoritarianist rule and Latvianness policy in all spheres of life, creating chambers of commerce, um, streamlining the, the language policies, uh, pretty much making everyone into the Latvian, finding uh, all kind of saboteurs and uh, enemies for the existing regime. And obviously minorities were quite easy scapegoats and knowing this anti-Jewish hysteria, obviously first targets were the Jewish schools, then because of the um, myth of 700 years of the German yoke, Germans were the second target. And then when in 1939, uh, Hitler called Germans back to the Third Reich, obviously, uh, and unfortunately for the Estonian and Latvian development, most of the Baltic Germans followed. And just a couple of weeks ago, we had a commemorative event about this very sad day back in 1939. 
Um, we speak about the USSR and the Nazi and again USSR occupation period, um, then it's rather un unfortunate that actually there was a utter transformation society which affected obviously the language policies. And uh, if we speak in a broad terms, if I speak about the broad brush uh, into the policy area, then uh, the, what happened was the creation of so-called Russian speaking schools and Latvian schools. And uh, Estonian uh, colleagues here, you pretty much know the same thing because the same story was all across the Soviet Union where uh, Russian students had uh, one year less to study rather than Estonians or Latvians. Um, uh, artificial segregation and putting Russians in one schools and Estonians in other schools followed pretty much the centralized and Russification policies from Moscow. Uh, so it was obvious that there was opposition to that. Um, there were a uh, certain role and three Baltic states differed in this sense. My colleague from Lithuania perhaps will touch on this because there was a certain role of Catholic Church. In liberalization process in Estonia there were student societies, start to university was a particular interesting point. In Latvian's case, unfortunately, there was no one plus differently from Lithuanian and, and Estonia. There was events of 1959 when Latvian National Communists uh, lashing out against the Soviet centralized industrial policies, which affected the language policy and national policy, because if uh, just give you one comparison, uh, in 1939, prior Soviet occupation, there were more than 75% ethnic Latvians. Then by 1959, this number had dropped down to 56%. So when you have your total population decline by 20 percent, it, it has certain effect. In democracies in today's European Union, it's obvious we discuss, democratically convene, uh, we agree, disagree, but there is a uh, people involved in this process. In Soviet Union, if you try to do something else, the best policy, you would be put under house arrest, if not sent to the Gulag. So uh, therefore, uh, in 1959, what distinguished Latvia from Estonia and Lithuania was that after uh, 1959, centralized Moscow policies were the norm. Um, they obviously made quite many mistakes. They prohibited midsummer celebration, which was mentioned here by my Estonian colleague, and actually created neo-paganism out of this celebration. Why today not only Estonians but also visiting Finns and Swedes are wondering why Latvians are such ardent midsummer celebrators. But the reason is that Soviet regime made this very important mistake. They prohibited for two years midsummer celebration during the Soviet occupation, which was the core celebr. So all Latvians said, if Soviets prohibit something, it must be so valuable that we must do it ten times more. So. Um, Therefore, uh, when a liberalization moment uh, got to the, uh, the apex in, in late 80s after the Gorbachev reforms in 1985 when he became a general secretary in 11th of March, then uh, obviously national symbols, uh, language was were first of the policies which were changed by at that time Supreme Council of uh, Latvia. And um, obviously it was based on the legal succession doctrine um, stating that we are not creating a new state as it was a case for Ukraine or Georgia or Armenia or Azerbaijan or Kazakhstan. But uh, Latvia, same as Lithuania and Estonia, followed the legal succession of the Republic of 1918. It was a very important legal point and obviously it allowed to basically rebuild the state structures which enabled us to faster overcome the transition period. Here again, one distinction between Lithuania and Estonia was that Latvia, differently from our Baltic cousins, we rolled over the constitution of 1922. So actually, we are exception amongst all the Central and European states in Europe because we st have, still have existing constitution of 1922. And Lithuanians and Estonians had to write it anew, which actually was beneficial for Lithuania and Estonia, but it's another discussion. And if you want to ask why, then it's in Q&A session. But uh, because of that, citizenship law obviously caused 
Uh, quite a big number of the former colonists who arrived here during the Soviet period. Uh, there have been discussions of what is uh, the best way to call them. Um, uh, my personal view is that my successor, uh, my previous colleagues at Latvian parliament, when they decided about the term uh, of those who didn't get citizenship, uh, wasn't really wise. They could have named them as permanent residents. Unfortunately, they used the term uh, non-citizens and anyone who is associated with a name non feels bad so it creates a bag, bad animosity and people are not happy about that but okay mistakes were made but it still gives a plenty of opportunity from uh, Moscow um, um, policymakers who want to have their goals achieved but in 2002 there was a uh, language reform, which basically changed this liberal period which started after Gorbachev reforms and continued all the way till 2002, and basically stated that actually this liberal period when at that time in many universities language of instruction was Russian, uh, there were some in English, uh, notably Stockholm School of Economics, and majority obviously in Latvian. So. Uh, giving you the numbers, as Estonian colleague gave you, there were there are 734 schools in together altogether. 99 of them are uh, non-Latvian speaking Russian schools, and then there are also two Polish schools. There is Estonian school, there is Lithuanian, Jewish, um, Belarusian, Ukrainian. So. Um, pretty much following the same uh, prescriptions what Paul Scheman was giving in, during the 1920s. And uh, if we speak about the language reform in 2002, then these schools were not touched in a reform of 2002, because in 2002 it was decided that all higher education in Latvia will be instructed in Latvian only. It caused, obviously, uh, demonstrations on streets of Riga. Uh, there was a per political turmoil. It happened to be in the first pages of the Moscow media. Uh, but it calmed down after uh, parents realized that actually now they have a clarity that they understand how their kids uh, will have uh, their future uh, instruction. Then uh, this um, uh, language reform uh, was continued in 2014. And uh, what is a common denominator between a language reform in 2002 and 2014 is the minister, Karla Shadurskis from the center-right Unity Party. And his understanding was uh, rather simple, that if we want to speak about the language of instruction, then because Latvia is not a federation, it's a unitary state, same as France or Estonia or Sweden. So language and instruction in a country is one. But at the same time, there are all also these minority schools. As I mentioned, there are 99 uh, Russian schools, there is Polish, Estonian, Jewish, Ukrainian, you name it. And each and every of the minority schools were happy except those 99 minority schools. And uh, it obviously created political turmoil between different political parties. And one of the biggest issues was kindergartens. Uh, most of you here uh, dealing with uh, languages and instruction know that the best way to teach kids languages at the kindergarten. And Riga in particular now ruled for the nine years by the Russophone Harmony Center Party and Mayor uh, Nils Sushakos, he doesn't care about having more Latvian uh, kindergartens, and this is really a political struggle in capital city of Riga of having more Latvian kindergartens because there are really lines for two years. Parents have to wait their kids to get into Latvian kindergarten, but at the same time they can immediately get in a Russian one, and then Latvian parents obviously they don't want to send their kids into the uh, Russian kindergartens. So basically, what we have is we have the language policy as a part of the non-citizens policy, which is actually a pawn into the Kremlin's and opportunistic political parties' games. So uh, uh, what happens from here is that actually to conclude, I see it's one minute left on my presentation, that um, actually for the last 27 years, major line for Latvian language policy has been survival of the Latvian language. Just look on Ireland. Ireland doesn't have the Celtic language 
left almost. They are just small islands on the western coast, but the major language of instruction is the imperial English language, even though some might disagree with me. But learning from Irish example, the Latvians understood that the major role is, and many United Nations, Council of Europe, European Union observation missions been saying that strengthening the role of Latvian language is really the case because of the demographics during the Soviet period. So what can we learn there is that actually there is still this don't ask, won't tell customary policy, even though language of instruction in businesses and a state, state uh, apparatus must be Estonian and Estonia, Latvian and Latvian, most of the Russian babushkas know that they can get the basic services in Russian language in drugstore or in a shop. So its policy still continues. There is no problem with that in the Baltic states on the social level. And finally, if we speak about multiculturalism, I believe it stems only from the strong language policies, if people know languages. So the norm in Europe is that two is absolutely must. Three is good and four is quite good, uh, quite better already. So therefore, if we speak about the, um, the, the example of Latvia and the language policy and the example for multiculturalism is that actually strengthening the role of Latvian language in state instruction has been the right um, path at the same time ensuring the minority languages that they have a right and they enrich the Latvian multilingual society. With strength of these minority languages, it's possibility to move on and have a multicultural uh, policy and also language policy developed further and as example for the rest of the European Union. Thank you.